Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session of cities. We are talking about cities today, and it's entitled Designing City 4.0, which means uh, how to uh, utilize the, the industry, fourth industrial revolution into the making the, the designing new cities, which is probably different from the, the shape of the cities in 20th century. Living space and a green environment or the time redundancy or the time with family even, it's been sacrificed and ignored in a 20th century type of cities. City, cities are no longer the place where the people come from rural area, live together under the stress and high density. City must be the place where the innovation occurs or the creative work and human life. And it becomes a place, sort of a factory of the new economic value, I think. So we have to design, we have to define the shape, the meaning of the smart city and smart nation. So we have the distinguished five guest panelists today. And uh, my aim, my, well, by the way, I have to introduce myself. My name is Yasu Ota from Japan. And Japan, as you know, is suffering from natural disaster. And the airport in Osaka is literally sinking under the water and at the airport in Hokkaido is shut down because of the historical earthquake. Everything is so historical. And every, <laughs> we are so used to historical stuff, but it's historical only on the record. But it's been like that. Every 20, 30 years, somebody pushed the reset button and destroyed everything we have to build from scratch. We are so used to it. And uh, if you take a look at the uh, uh, TV shows and showing that the Japanese rail, railroad system in Tokyo, and the people are crammed into the cars, and uh, the station staff pushes you back and behind, behind you into the cars. And in all sudden, I felt like, wait a minute, is this a good place to make a creation or innovation? Or I can be a creative? No, I don't think so. Emerging market nations in Asia has advantage because you don't need to worry about too much about the legacy negatively, but uh, you have to start from scratch and design a new, jump into the new world, right? Uh, Minister Puducherry from Singapore. Uh, he is a senior minister of the state of transport and uh, I think you are supervising the, the ambitious agenda, smart city, smart nation. And you are in charge of the communication and uh, information, as well as uh, transportation. And uh, we will hear a lot about uh, the idea of the smart nation from you later. And uh, security Nguyen from Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh is one of the biggest cities in this region. It's one of the most, my favorite towns, cities in this region because every time I go to Ho Chi Minh, I feel like I'm freed. And uh, there's activity of art and the people who are gathered from all over the world, the young people. And uh, it's also surrounded by the water and it's a lot of the space of the city is, is under the beneath the level of the sea water. So we have to talk about that. Uh, resilience of the town later. And Rebecca is a designer and architect. And, but she's not just designing the building itself, but also she, she would be able to share your view on uh, how to design the whole space and as a container of the human, and what is the design thinking in terms of the designing the, the cities in the future. And you are leading the, the so you are the founder of the Plaza and the Partners, which is a, sort of a team of designer, architects, and the interior coordinator, and uh, the urban planner. So it's, she might bring a new idea of designing. And Vish, you are from Cisco, 
or information technology companies, you know, supervising the whole the region, not just the, the ASEAN, but also the Pacific region too, right? And he has a lot of experience in designing the cities in the India and China, as well as in Singapore. So I'm so excited to have you view something. Marcus is my old friend from Bangkok based in, how long have you been in Bangkok? You seems to have settled down in Bangkok, but uh, she, he's from Siemens, a German company, and he knows a lot of things about the transportation infrastructure and the power supply. Okay, let's talk. Let's begin with the conversation with the minister. Smart nation, smart city. We are so used to the idea of smart, but we don't really understand what's the meaning of the smart. At the beginning of the project, I thought I was in Singapore, that Singapore government is just trying to make a full use of the technology in designing a city, but it seems like you are trying to transform nation itself into the, something new. Would you please give us the, some ideas what really you want, you're trying to do? You just hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, if you look back in Singapore's history, We've had uh, a very aggressive approach to redesigning our economy, to uh, looking at how we will redesign the physical nature of our city, as well as the opportunities for our people. Um, every five to seven years, we've had to think of what we needed to intervene, what space we needed to intervene in, what are the levers we needed to insert. But this particular wave has Smart Nation as a big part of it because uh, the impact of technology is going to be quite different. And so that idea of transformation through technology is at the heart of what we want to do with our smart nation. We want to reconfigure our economy, reconfigure the social aspects of our society, as well as government. Three major strategies, three major areas, uh, and tease it all to tie it all together in a way that generates a sense of opportunity and hope going forward. We are a resource-constrained nation, small island. Um, those things are not going to change anytime soon. How do we then use the, the transformative power that technology can afford us in order to then think of what we can do forward? Smart then, from our definition point of view, uh, needs to be transformative. Not every project that the agencies come to us for funding, we're going to give them funding, especially if it isn't transformative. 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 It needs to generate a new set of opportunities. It needs to generate jobs. It needs to generate real-world outcomes on the basis of today's uh, assessment. And it needs to create an opportunity for change. And that opportunity for change needs to be on two levels. It needs to generate in Singapore some capability that we didn't already previously have. No point looking at a project and calling it a smart nation project if all it is is about digitizing business as usual. It needs to have a runway which is going to generate some capability in our people, in our ecosystem, in our businesses that we don't have currently have today. And it needs to generate an opportunity for policy optimization, regulatory optimization, legislative change. So again, make the assumption that we want, want to disrupt ourselves. So transformation through technology, the generation of new opportunities, and uh, generation of new capabilities. It cannot be business as usual. Mm. So for us, the line between smart nation and smart city is not an issue. Our nation is our city and our city is our nation. We, right. don't have to, we don't have to wrestle with that problem. We will leave that to larger jurisdictions to settle. Okay. But it means that our appetite for risk, how we deal with the risks associated with this journey, have to be t dealt with in a very different way compared to other, uh, other jurisdictions. We, we, we don't have uh, a second location that we can try something if a whole nation deployment goes wrong. And, and, but it also generates a sense around the social aspects where uh, we, we must almost by design think about a 100% inclusion for our citizens in whatever opportunity is created. Because if we don't, if we take an 80-20 rule, if we take a first mover, late adopter rule, the people who benefit are living cheek by jowl with the people who are left behind. So by design, we have to be 100% inclusive. So that's the sort of big picture view of how we see ourselves as smart nation why we believe that this is just merely the latest wave in that series of ongoing transformations that we've been engaged in since our independent nationhood. Mm. That's very interesting, transformativeness. So you, uh, that's so in terms of the, in other words, it's maybe a flexibility and uh, resilience maybe? 
Absolutely. So we insist that when we look at the projects and the uh, uh, ideas that are being looked, for, being uh, that are asking for funding under our Smart Nation project, that they, it needs to meet certain uh, criteria. One of which is the idea of interoperability, both with our legacy systems, but also with the, the modules that they come along with, such that we can now subsequently swap things in and swap things out and not have a capture under a particular technology or te process. The second is that it should increase system resilience going forward rather than lead to a single critical point of failure. So uh, what it means is then in our smart nation journey, we're prepared to be a little bit less efficient in order to generate a better resilience going forward. That's very interesting. So the image of the future city is like soft. It's moving, the flexible. It's not a rigid in the skyscraper and the concrete, and, but also more like a flexible moving, changing itself type of things, right, isn't it? Well, absolutely. Wearing now my other hat in the Ministry of Transport, yeah. uh, we would very much like to take a flexible approach to our urban renewal um, uh, in Singapore. We have in our history, uh, uh, history. I, I know you were not hoping to think about history, but in our history we've had some very aggressive approaches around land acquisition and redevelopment. Right. But going forward, uh, realistically, we need to take a, a softer approach and a much more uh, incremental progressive approach and diffuse some of these opportunities across various mm. parts of Singapore. If you're familiar with Singapore, you know there's a concentration towards the south and we need to sort of create opportunities in a number of centers and think about how we redesign our city. Mm. So the short answer to the question is yes. It's interesting. Rebecca, I, I need to hear from you, from your opinion, from the point of view of a designer. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think is the real issue we have to really focus on now when it comes to the designing the future? We cannot just throw the, the draft, but uh, you have to narrow and you have to tackle the, the identify the issues you are looking at, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, while it is, great and it is great to be optimistic to look really forward, I think if we apply the design thinking process into, into designing our future cities, we must first look at an informed view of the past and the present in order to create design solutions that look forward. Um, and in saying this, I think it's important first to address three major challenges um, that we must overcome in order to look at our future cities. First and foremost, much of our um, infrastructure in the region is really still built on 20th century design principles, when in fact we are dealing with 21st century, um, 21st century situations and conditions and requirements. So we, that definitely needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. At the moment, four, four billion people live in cities. That is um, half the world's population, and that is also more than there were people in the 1970s. In the 1900s, um, there were only 13% 13, 13 of the world's population were living in cities. So now we must really address this. We must address scale. And I think um, to move forward, that needs, to be, that needs to be considered. But in the speed of which we've been moving, I think we have forgotten the human scale. In the 1960s, after the post-war, we began to build cities with, with lanes, uh, with, with car lanes for, that were about six, eight, um, ten lanes wide. And we then began to build cities for cars and not people. Yeah, bigger is better, so wider is better, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think in doing that, we forgot, we forgot ourselves. We then began to build cities that were for the scale of dinosaurs and not people, not the human scale. Um, and there's a, there's a, Danish, um, a Danish architect, Jan Gell, he pointed out that we began building cities that were, that moved at five, from, we started 150 years ago building cities that moved at five kilometers per hour and then we moved to 60 kilometers per hour and everything just started moving so fast and we forgot the human scale. So we must be designing cities with people at the epicenter of the town planning narrative. And I think, as you mentioned, one of the most important imperatives that we can no longer ignore is climate change. 
as we speak at the moment, Manila is again being plagued by what they call yet again the most destructive typhoon of the year. And this, this poses a threat to cities every year. So how do we start building cities that address all of these? And I think first and foremost, we must be designing cities for 20, 30, 40, 60, 80 million people. And I think it's an opportunistic time and a really exciting time for us in the ASEAN because previously where we used to look at our Western counterparts for precedence, we now must create our own solutions. We must, there no longer is the, we can no longer rely on precedence. Um, it must come from within. And I think that's why it makes it so exciting to be an architect at this day and age. And um, in doing so, like I said, people must be at the epicenter of all of this. People are the lifeblood of cities. People are the lifeblood of relationships. And relationships are the lifeblood of stories. And it is stories, relationships, and all these humanistic endeavors that really shape humanity. And this is what shapes the architecture that in turn shapes the cities that then, in sh that then shape us. So all of this can be addressed with a holistic environmental approach, whereby we achieve li livability in the broadest sense through the pedestrianization of cities. Um, uh, the, all these gentlemen have really great ideas to share about um, technological ad advancements in transport, but these can only be done if the framework of the city addresses accessible transport um, accessible public transportation, um, small, scalable, human-scale human um, city blocks. Yeah, actually, I prefer walking to, uh, to riding the cars or the, taking the train. This is a natural behavior of the human race. Yes, it is, and I we think... We sometimes forget about that. We, we have, especially in create, designing cities um, for dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, and actually, you say that it's quite fascinating. Um, a few days ago, I was walking around the old quarter of Hanoi, and you know, this was, this was designed years and years and years back. And so it was nice because it was all human scale. It was designed with people at the core. And then, of course, there's climate change, where we must be creating um, cities that are convenient and sustainable. Mm. and they must be equipped to recover quickly mm. from climate disasters with minimal financial implications. Okay, is. so uh, we are so used to the, the idea of, uh, of the 20th century type of the cities where the people are, uh, has, to be, has, to, has to live and, and, and uh, spend the time in a small place, space and, 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 uh, and uh, to work uh, for the sake of the efficiency or the jobs or uh, economic growth, or income growth, under the stress. But uh, come to the original point we have, to think, so what is uh, the benefit? What is a good place for the human? So you, that's what you, you were talking about. And you talked about the, the scale of a town. Mm -hmm. And Vish, you have a lot of experience in, in, in Asia and the other regions. So what do you think of the appropriate scale of the smart cities in the future? See, actually the fundamental challenge is in Asia we are seeing rapid urbanization. So just in this one hour that we are discussing the subject, close to 10,000 people are migrating from villages to cities. Right. And why is that? Just in ASEAN, I think by 2030, 90 million people mm. will move from villages, rural markets to urban markets. And the fundamental question you need to ask is why are people migrating? They're migrating to find jobs. They're migrating to get quality health care. They're migrating to get quality education. And to your point, to have a better quality of life. And that, I think, is the fundamental force change that we are seeing. That puts significant stress on existing cities yes. that were not designed for this level of mass 
urbanization. Mm -hmm. Now, in this context, you got to look at, when you look at it from an Asia Pacific perspective, there are two types of cities. There are mega cities that are 15, 20 million, that are bursting already, where there is more and more people coming in. And then there are smaller cities, which I feel is where the next engine of focus needs to be in larger countries, uh, where they really need to make these services affordable and available. That's where I think technology can play a key role. The reason I say that is if you really look at the way cities were built before, you build physical infrastructure, you build architecture, and that's how cities were built. But today, if you were to reinvent that same norm, you can actually build physical and digital infrastructure simultaneously so that you can avail, make available all these services to the citizen at the get-go. So I feel in Asia, I think you need to make smaller cities more attractive to live in so that you can decongest the major cities. The major cities, if you really look at it, what are the physical and technological options that you have? The option is, is to actually urbanize the infrastructure with a lot of sensors so that you actually at least know, like let's take smart transportation, which General spoke about. If you really know where the pockets of congestion are in the stations, in the train stations, in the metro stations, in the buses, you can use that knowledge to redirect and probably reconfigure how those systems will be engineered. And we've physically seen, for example, in our initial deployments around smart transportation, I think more and more people with disposable income are buying cars. And I think on the road, we realize that 20% of the traffic is actually trying to find parking space. <laughs> so True. if you can just have these systems talking to each other and make it easy for a citizen on a mobile phone to go to the right place, you're going to get orders of magnitude of efficiency. And the other area is, I think for most cities, I think everyone says, I want to make it smart. But what is the business model? What is the financial model? And will it be viable? And that's where you really need to think of who's going to fund this? Is it going to be only the government? Because all the governments in every country want to do more with less. So that's again, and an area where private and public need to come together, stitch the right business model that makes sense, offer more affordable services with an efficient right. execution model. So it's not, I, I think the challenge is, technological I think is the easier part. Uh, the business model part is a little harder. But the most important thing is to General's point is how do you ensure that with these new sets of capabilities, mm -hmm. the way you used to design your city needs to completely be changed because you build vertical silos in the way you build cities. Mm -hmm. Now with technology, those silos make no more as much sense. So how you can sh actually retrain people, retrain mindsets to fully monetize the opportunity, I think is a big challenge that we have in this part of the world. I found the Rebecca on the dish uh, brought the very important issue, the points, which is the human scale. We have to think back to the original uh, base in a way we should start thinking about the futures. Uh, human should be the center of this, this issue, not, not the cars. Talking about the infrastructure of transportation, I, I think uh, Marcus knows things about it. So when it comes to the uh, next generation transportation system, we tend to, to think about the speed and uh, uh, efficiency. But uh, as Rebecca says, see, I think there's two ways, Minister. If you have a congestion in, in the traffic in the city, like Manila or Jakarta, th there's only two ways. One is to broaden the, the, the road, to have more traffic capacity. The other one is to decrease the number of cars. And Singapore seems to be trying to do the second one by using more bus, buses and sharing economy. 
I will let you Marcus talk about it. Sharing economy is it's it's amazing phenomenon. I think uh, the, this afternoon the Gojek, the Indonesian the entrepreneur, has just announced entering the market in Vietnam with a joint venture. Which means uh, this kind of innovation of uh, business model hasn't happened in in Japan, for example, but in Jakarta, which means that you don't really need a broader road, but you have the, the bikes and the share economy. So when it comes to the, the new transportation system in the future, Marcus, what do you think your business might be altered? I think uh, definitely uh, there is, is a high demand, uh, especially when you see on, on the traffic congestion in, uh, in the cities, which have a huge impact on the economy itself, on the environment, and for sure on the quality of living. Yeah? And, and this all works to, to, together. And that is something what needs to be achieved. Uh, don't have this uh, congestion anymore. Uh, you, you need transport systems uh, which are, on one hand, intelligent. But I would even say, once they further, you have to a total integrated intelligence infrastructure. It starts uh, uh, with the mass transportation, with light rail, with tram, with, 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 with the metro lines, is, is one of the things. Another topic is what has to come in, in the future here and there, some words are already spent about it, is uh, cars, car sharing, e-cars, e-car sharing, e-car, uh, smart uh, e-charging, the same topic for bikes, uh, to, to minimize or to reduce at least, uh, I would say, the, the quantity of the vehicles in, in town if you share it. That is a big, um, I would say, reduction. Uh, autonomous driving, I would think that, that is something also which is going to come on a long term. But for this, of course, you need the regulatory framework. People have to follow rules and regulations, uh, otherwise it, it will not work. But the smartness, <coughs> smartness to, to, to collect all the data uh, for the new future cities, uh, to have them in a cloud-based uh, IoT open platform uh, and make out of apps use of it. We mentioned it or we heard about it, smart parking. Uh, where is parking available? Uh, all these kind of things to optimize the timing and don't waste the time and li or also to limit the time these vehicles are on the roads and, and block them. Yeah? I think this is something which is going to come, which needs to come, but it's a long way to go. And uh, I think the future, when it comes to data, uh, I was saying that is something which helps us to make a better life in the cities to, to simulate based on the existing data uh, how this, this, the future cities needs to be readjusted uh, to make it, uh, I would say, livable uh, and give the opportunity for the people, as I said, uh, to have a better life, to have more time for their own life, to have more time maybe for working, maybe for, for learning. I think it will, on the long run, it will benefit to each and everybody, I think. And uh, we are, I would say, at the stage where certain technologies are available already these days, uh, and it's time to embrace it. Uh, Singapore is, of course, an, 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 I would say, an excellent uh, example what they have already integrated uh, when it comes to train system, when you come even, uh, uh, I would say, uh, digital assets management and all these kind of things, predictable maintenance, yeah? It's uh, to avoid the the breakdowns on the streets, which is another additional uh, uh, congestion, uh, I would say, topic and issue. So this has to come for the future, make particular maintenance, repair before that it breaks down, and that gives, gives, gives uh, relief, I would think, for the, all the people involved in these cities. And we will not, as it was said before, I would say, avoid the urbanization. The urbanization is, 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 is a global trend. Uh, it happened in Europe, it happened especially here in, in, in Asia. And therefore, we need to uh, definitely find some smart so solutions. And this goes with intelligence, infrastructure, and then I think this is the way forward uh, we have to go. Secretary mm. Nguyen. Ho Chi Minh is changing so rapidly. So if you visit there in, in three years' time, so you will see the different scenery. And uh, I think the, the, the subway is still under construction. But, uh, but every time I visit there, I see the different views from the hotel windows. How, what do you think that the charm of the Ho Chi Minh city, why the Ho Chi Minh is attracting people? 
from the regions. And uh, what is your intention? What kind of city do you want to make the Ho Chi Minh would be? The charm is one side. The challenges are the other side of the okay. city. Okay. <laughs> Historically, um, well, Ho Chi Minh City and location where people from different uh, regions came to us. 200 years ago, some uh, group of Chinese people, they moved from the north to us. They stayed there. Right. Yeah, the French uh, priest, they came to introduce uh, Christianity in Ho Chi Minh City. So historically, we were open to different cultures, different ethnic groups. So this is tradition. So we accept the differences. We don't uh, become alert if we see something different. So the differences in cancer is one reason where no thing is promoted to be there. I go back to the other side. 100 years ago, the French uh, people designed the city for maximum 3 million people. Okay. So 10 times than the then population, but now we are 10 million. So all technical infrastructure are overloaded. So big city, big problem. But we have three times higher than the nation average in productivity. 2.5 times higher than personal uh, income. So people come to the city. And according to our law, we cannot prevent people to move from the rural center to urban center. And now, Every five years, we have one million more citizens in the city. Mm. Every five years. How to cope with this situation? So we learned. We learned from Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense, we should look careful in the future, in planning process, so that we won't be surprised by problems. We have to be recognized earlier. So if we design the... Um, smart city concept, we set four targets. The first one, to ensure sustainable and relatively high growth of economy. So how can we do it? We have to collect data from the past and we have to simulate the development and we create forecasts. If we see the traffic jam is increasing every day. We ask why, and I check this one. 20 years ago, out of 100 people, we have 25 motorbikes. And today, 100 people have 100 motorbikes and car. <laughs> and by 2025, 100 people have 150 car or motorbikes. So if we don't change anything seriously, we will move to that direction we will die by traffic jam. So for us, smart city means smart management, smart administration. Administration based on analysis and forecast. One example. So if we can accept 100 people and 150 motorbike and car, we have to make solution so that they don't have the need to have so many car and, and, and so on. Bit flooding, you mentioned beginning. People realize flooding is more frequent and lasts longer each time. And why? We look at the past, at the history. Now we realize the rain is more frequent. Heavy rain, more rain. And the sea level is rising every year one centimeter. And the surface of the city sinking every year one centimeter. So the three combinations, more rain, rising sea level, and sinking earth surface, create the flooding. And why the surface is sinking? We use too much water, underground water. Mm -hmm. So we are now developing a new solution to limit and to stop using ground water in order to keep the surface sustainable. And you can simulate. If we keep living that way, how long and how deep we went under the water. So for us, is smart city means smart management, smart design. 
I go back to your example with uh, transportation need. Historically, Ho Chi Minh City had out of one center in the middle. People all moved to the center and the deep south, they commute every day. Now we come to the next strategy, satellite center. Satellite city within the big city. So if they stay satellite town, they have enough service. They don't have to move every day to the center. So we need a smart design of the city. Yeah. One point. And the, the last point, I escaped the two other points. The role of citizens. You cannot have an administration of 10,000 people and manage 10 million people. It won't go. 10 million people are 10 million head with smart idea. We have to collect the suggestion to get the feedback. Mm -hmm. So we learn from Singapore. Every citizen is a social um, sensor. Every person is a social sensor. What they see happening in the city, they convey the picture, the message to us, and they make suggestions. So utilize the human resource to solve the human problem in combination. But we just uh, finished, we just launched the city, smart city concept one year. So you have to wait a little one year more to see the result. See. Okay. <laughs> well, from your talk, I think uh, I, some two, two points pops up in my mind. One is uh, the role of the government. And uh, if the, let, let everything do that, the market, you know, I don't think the market can resolve all the issues. So, so they have to be some right. role that the government has to play. And it comes to the point where we should discuss about democracy. And uh, if the democracy is the best solution for the designing a new city, but uh, this may be too complicated, so we put it. <laughs> 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 but uh, I have a question to Rebecca. Uh, so the secretary mentioned the, the French design. I mean, French people were so smart enough, very good in designing a cities, centralized. <laughs> Washington DC, for example, in the Paris, there's a center, and there's a uh, star type of the ship. The, the road is uh, coming out from the center, out, out to the, the rim of the rings. But um, there is a the premise is that there should be a center of the city, which may be connected to the idea of the power of governance. But what do you think, from designer's point of view, what is, uh, do, do we need a really center of the town when the people are connected through the broadband and you can work at home? Mm -hmm. What do you think? I actually think that it is now a time of democratizing, it is a time of democratizing information. And um, I think it is a great time to be rethinking our urban services and particularly the monolithic infrastructure, um, monolithic institutions of the past. I think that um, we, must be, we must start breaking down the barriers of these institutions and letting them come down so that, again, back to what I keep stressing on people, um, social engagement can happen between the institution and and the community and society. I think um, as we move forward, um, we must be creating socially relevant architecture that works as a network of inclusive and barrier-free spaces. And in these monolithic institutions in the future will be replaced by a series of local a series of a localized network of smaller versions of this um, that are closer to people, that are um, more accessible and relevant to that specific community. Um, an example of this is actually a library that um, an architecture firm in the Philippines has been exploring. This is called the Bookstop. Um, in the Philippines, the libraries are not necessarily the, the, the greatest uh, buildings that we have, but it is really about access to information. So what that experiment of the bookstop was doing was creating um, free libraries around the city, leaving these small 
10 square meter boxes of libraries whereby people leave a book and you take a book. Uh -huh. But then you now give, every, you now make information accessible to everybody and it worked. Um, it works. So what you are doing now is decongesting the center and creating multipolar, um, multi, uh, multipolar um, cores and centers around the city so that people don't really have to walk so far anymore. People don't really have to travel so far anymore. Another thing that we're doing is um, we're breaking down even shopping centers whereby previously in the past people would have to drive um, the American model of supermarkets and shopping centers, you would have to drive to the outskirts of the city to get your groceries, but now you see the rise of um, corner shops and smaller um, local supermarkets whereby you would just need to walk. Um, and I think that's really what we are moving towards. I, I spent quite some time in London and um, you would see the breakdown, the, well not the breakdown, but the S these smaller Sainsbury locals and Tesco metros became more popular than, than the big, big, big supermarket format. So I think we are moving toward that. And, and in effect, cities become, um, uh, you have s several cores and multipolar mm. centers. Minister Puttacheri, what is uh, Singapore's idea of the centralization and the pluralization? And uh, the reason why I like Singapore, I li living in Singapore for three years, is everything is in work distance. Mm. And if you like, you can walk to the office. If you like, in a mood of uh, riding the bike, then you can move. Then uh, if you want to reach the green, you can take just a bus or the trains, well, compact. I don't see there is uh, any specific center of the nation. Well, it's because of the simply it's because of the scale of the nation. But uh, when it comes to the center and uh, the connecting the people equally, it's, uh, what is the idea of the smart city, smart nation? Well, I think it's not quite so simple, and mm -hmm. I think the assumption that it's an either or it, it oversimplifies a, what is a really a, an intrinsic human behavior. We like to gather. We are social, right? And and sometimes that gathering needs to happen on a, sort of a smaller, intimate, local level. And sometimes the gathering has to happen on a larger scale. And that is the nature of the of the of, of the human response. Okay. And um, I, I'll answer this in, in two parts. One is to actually talk about libraries and the experience that we've had in Singapore, uh, and what the human behavior has demonstrated to us. We we we've had a significant redevelopment of our public library spaces. And some of it was around the kind of thinking that Rebecca talked about. How do you take a, a resource, a national public good, and distribute it out into every town and, and so forth? Um, that, that involved a significant amount of technology and transformation and e-books and e-audio books and a digital platform. Uh, but what we saw as a result of removing some of the obstacles associated with engaging with the libraries is that a significant increase in engagement occurred. So now today, one in two Singaporeans will have visited the library, a public library, over the last year, and our regular users of it. So the, the attendance at libraries went up as a result of our process. But it wasn't necessarily that it was going up in a decentralized manner, because there are just some things for which you need to go to the Central National Library on Victoria Street. And you have to then pay the price of the congestion and the crowdedness on the MRT, but it's worthwhile. Uh, because you've become engaged in that process. So the, the human behavior around our increase in convenience uh, in a way uh, tells us that perhaps it's not quite so simple as that. There are times we want to decentralize and there are the times we want to come together. And so part of that process, of course, has to be about one aspect that I've just mentioned, which is about getting the price right. Um, and in Singapore, we've, we've had to take quite a lot of political heat, but we have, we think, got on the right direction for pricing our roads and our road congestions uh, correctly. The price of owning a car in Singapore is very high. Uh, the taxation is high, the paper use is high, the cost of petrol is high, and on top of that, we make sure that the price of parking is high, none of which is popular. <laughs> um, but as a result, we've had the position of zero vehicle growth rate now for a number of years, and yes, we're holding on to that position. 
And now we are seeing the car, the household car ownership come down. So only 37% or 39%, I think. We saw a reduction this year below 40% of households having access to a car. Um, now that is it, even though we have had population growth. So getting the price right and understanding the human behavior, I think, is going to be essential to designing that future city. But as far as that issue of the center versus the periphery, if we look at the overall design of our city and what we're trying to do in the next bound, uh, we're trying to encourage a significant increase in walking, cycling, riding public transport. We want to go from a 67% mode share of public transport today to 75% in 2030. Mm. But what it means is we're going to need to have multiple centers in every town, walkable mm. uh, access to facilities and amenities, uh, a distribution of businesses and business opportunities so people are living closer to, to where they work. But I think we also need to appreciate that human need to gather once in a while. And what that means is this cannot be an excuse for us to not invest in the kind of infrastructure to bring people to the city center. So, I mean, our current plans are $20 billion of public transport infrastructure over the next five years because people will continue to want to come to Orchard Road and Marina Bay. Right. Those are the centers. Yeah. One for shopping, one for our national gathering, but I haven't mentioned food because every Singaporean argues about where the best center for food is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to open that debate. Um, <laughs> But I think we need to think in those terms. There is a need for human local centers. There is a need for us then to appreciate that you do need those large central centers once in a while. And what is the correct costing model, operating model, and investment model that will allow that process to occur over a number of years? Uh, and, and that is the position that we're taking. I see. I guess it's a phenomenon that at the, the, for the first time it's the number of cars declining. No, the number of cars is remaining the same. Remains the same. But the number of households that have access oh, okay. to cars is declining. That's interesting. So what that means is that under our system of a certificate of entitlement, you buy a piece of paper that allows you to own a car for 10 years, and that certificate then get recycled. We may have to make the assumption that an increasing number of those vehicles now are being used either in the taxi industry or the point-to-point -point industry. They're being recycled for commercial purposes rather than for private ownership as a, as a household. The number of cars... The number of vehicles on the, on the road has remained static, but the amount of private ownership has begun to decline. That's the consequence of the policy, right? I mean, the tax system and the... Well, I think it's a consequence of a number of things. You need to get the price right, the car ownership, the taxation, the fuel, the parking. Uh, but you need to then have the public transport uh, opportunities that's there. And that is something that we've had to struggle with uh, until quite recently. We've had to invest quite a lot over the last five years to increase our public transport infrastructure. But I think that is now paying off in these kind of statistics that we're seeing. I, and I won't downplay the positive impact that we have seen in terms of the uh, new business models that both the point-to-point -point car industry as well as the bike sharing industry have brought. There are just many more options. Um, and I think that has also added to uh, that, that progress along that front. Very interesting. I'd like to move on to the, the, the aspect of the culture and the art and the creativity, which is an important function of town, I think, cities. Because uh, I feel like uh, when I first went to the, the city of the Singapore, maybe uh, five, six years ago, as a visitor, I found the, the Marina Bay Sands is so weird. You know, having the, the ship shape the, <coughs> of, of things on the top of the building, and it looks so unstable. I mean, you know, <laughs> as a person who came from earthquake nations, it's, <laughs> it's so scary, right? But um, as time goes, and I spent uh, three years there, and I feel like, uh, okay, this is, uh, you know, charm. I mean, I, that reminds me that uh, at the beginning of the Eiffel Tower in the Paris was built, uh, Dr. Eiffel is under the heavy attack by the citizens of the city, saying that this is such an ugly building, so it doesn't fit Paris. But now it's become the icon of the town, right? So probably the Marina Bay Sands become, is becoming the icon of the people. Anyway, so I have a question to Marcus. You live in the Bangkok, chaotic town congestion and traffic jams. It's incredible. But I still like uh, Bangkok because of this 
energy, you know, coming out from the people, and uh, the people whole about idea of the, the racial background and the religious background and the white people and the Asians. A lot of people getting together there and to be make a lot of noises, and it's fun, which I miss in Singapore actually. I mean, everything is so neat. We go to Bangkok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Manila. I should say, Ho Chi Minh City. Oh, Manila is good. And Manila. <laughs> and I guess the Japan and Tokyo is losing that power. I mean, everything is so, so homogeneous, and people behave so neatly and nicely. And, and <laughs> you should go to Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> I think the dynamism of the city comes from that part of the activity. So this is a good function of the cities, and which is the origin and source of the creativity and the new culture. And I, I see the, the, that element in Ho Chi Minh too. So what is the charm for, you live in Bangkok for five, six years, right? And four years, you, a little bit over four years. It doesn't want to leave, right? So which, <laughs> which means, what makes you think that way? I mean, you, you think that the Jimin's have the center of office in Bangkok, not in Singapore, right? No, 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 we have uh, the, the regional center is in, in, in Singapore. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're taking care, I would say, out of Thailand and neighboring countries like Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos. Um, yeah, I would say, of course, uh, when it comes to, to, to entertainment and, 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 and I would say multicultural and the spirit, it's uh, most probably a little bit uh, more entertaining and enjoying than, than, than in, in, in Singapore. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think Bangkok itself, I would say, when it comes also to, to the quality of living, uh, I would say there, there is a lot to improve. Huh? Uh, they did already a lot on, on, on the metro lines. The current government is spending, uh, I would say, also a fortune on expanding uh, also this uh, metro system, monorail system, uh, tram, and, and, and so on, which uh, is a little bit up. But nevertheless, when you see how fast it is growing and uh, how the roads were built and how traffic congestion is getting more and more and more. And one of the, the negative aspects uh, definitely of, of traffic congestion between uh, or spending a lot of time there, losing time there, uh, is one hand. But the other hand is it gives you also an environmental impact. Yeah? The air quality goes dramatically up in, 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 in the bad way. When you when you see in these years, uh, there were a lot of haste days uh, there, which is not healthy for anybody living in, in that city. And uh, that is, of course, the counter effect. And, and in this regard, I think uh, we all have to optimize it. It starts from the traffic itself, but it's not only to the traffic, it's the whole design, the design of the buildings to make them more energy efficient, uh, yeah, make a higher energy efficient use, yeah? how to do it, uh, do the smart metering, do uh, even on, on, on water management uh, to see a, a leakage in an early stage rather than, than, than whenever it comes uh, out of the ground. Yeah? Uh, uh, all these kind of things are needed for, I would say, for the cities of the future to make them, I would say, comfortable or more comfortable for the people the people, regardless if they're, it's a vibrating city or is, is it a more regulated city, uh, I was saying uh, enhancement for the people, for their people lives is very important and there are so many aspects to be considered and this uh, luckily can all be solved on the long term due to technology which is available these days and is going to be available in the future, which, which was not the case uh, a, a decade ago. Yeah? Secretary Nguyen, uh, we, we, this may be a mean question, but uh, we tend to compare Hanoi and the Ho Chi Minh. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> you chair the discussion, you can raise any question. Okay. <laughs> Are you from this region originally? Both. I was born in the that south, but I grew up in the north. That's not a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> But you are running a city of the Ho Chi Minh now, so yeah. you're in the same Ho Chi Minh side. I see major difference between two towns, right? It depends, but uh, I, I may say a few differences. Okay. Uh, in Hanoi, at uh, 10 p.m., the shop almost closed all. 
No food at all. Hosu mi city, midnight still eating. Thank you for that. Yeah. People in Hosu mi city, they have three special characteristics. The foreigner observe. When they make study how it's with learning in the city, they send people to the school in the evening. Half of the school attendants are adults. So people willing to learn, not theoretically, but practice almost lifelong. So we learn. If we work, we work also very hard. We compete because we have very early market economy through interaction, but we enjoy life. So the three point learning, hard working and enjoy life. And the last one I mentioned, accepting diversity of culture and ethnic. So these are the three, four features that make the city attractive for certain people and sometimes noisy for some people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds very like, uh, I prefer the... And last point, uh, okay. Hanoi has long history. Uh, more than 1,000 years capital of the land and Ho Chi Minh City is 300 years old, young. I see. Young city, different kind of people, interaction strong. So we are late comer, we have to work hard. Uh -huh. <laughs> Working hard. Yeah. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time. One example, we have so many Korean restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many Japanese restaurants. We have so many Indian cuisine in Ho Chi Minh City. We have the choice. Yeah, we are competing with the other. <laughs> 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 well, such an activity, a cultural activity, I would say, is one of the most important functions of the, the mega town and huge towns. Now, Rebecca, I want to ask you about the, the something called the design thinking. And designing, is not just the design, the outlook of the, the things, materials, but also well, you have to design the, the human behavior in, in there. Uh, as a designer or architect, so what, what do you have in your mind? Uh, if you were, have a free hand to, to draw the whole the picture of the future town, the design from scratch, mm -hmm. what do you think is the most important element to boost the people's activity and to to accelerate the, the creativity of the people? Well, as I men mentioned earlier, the, we need to address the challenges. But I think in order to address these challenges, there are obvious solutions. But the process of the how is what is really important. And the how must be highlighted. Um, and I think that's where the design thinking really um, takes center stage. So I think first and foremost, um, similar to what um, the gentleman said earlier, is that we must involve all of the stakeholders in the design of future cities. Um, great cities are a product of collaboration and inclusion. Um, collaboration of architects, business leaders, designers, um, engineers, government officials, in order to create what serves our current needs and also our ever-evolving needs. Um, I think that um, also apart from collaboration and innovation, we go back to social relevance. Um, we need to create buildings again that are socially relevant. We need to create cities that respond to our needs. And through all this data, and the data analysis and all these new applications of new technology, we are able to create buildings and cities that are adaptable. Um, we talked about the population of cities growing exponentially over the last years, and that being one of the reasons for which our cities no longer service our needs. The future city that we create must be adaptable and responsive. Um, we must move toward buildings that, are, that do not rigidly determine the way we use them and instead just highlight our creativity and highlight, um, the, way, and highlight the way that we use them and encourage, encourage growth and development. And 
that I think feeds and informs culture and how that influences um, future cities. I see you're talking about the inclusiveness of the different uh, the stakeholders. So mm -hmm. city and the future is not just given by the government, neither by the party, right? Vish, mm -hmm. finally, I think uh, we have more time to pick up the question from the floor. So just briefly, I'm going to ask you, uh, talking about the India, for example, mm -hmm. you have a lot of experience in India to create new towns. Mm -hmm. And what is the biggest learning you got from the, your experience and uh, utilizing the technology in, to design new features? Which Actually, may be different from the uh, experience by uh, Secretary or the Singapore. So I think, look, uh, when you have a new city to be built, and there are a few new cities that are being built with close partnership with the Singapore government so that we can learn, especially in the state of Telangana, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, <coughs> I think it's the same point that Chairman Nan made, which is about satellite centers, because you have cities which are 15, 20 million. So there is a whole collection of satellite centers uh, or satellite cities that are being built ground up. And there actually the government has the ability to think of physical spaces, to think of green spaces. And I think the most important point is why will a person go and stay in a satellite city? He'll only stay if his quality of life is better mm. and he's got an experiential, aspirational experience from that city. So the way we are seeing things like music, architecture, movies, the way the malls are being designed is to provide that aha experience mm. for every consumer. And then also building the supporting ecosystem in terms of schools, in terms of hospitals, in terms of making it attractive for large companies to decongest and make it interesting for them to actually move their businesses to those satellite centers. So essentially one of the things that there is a real focus on to move the fulcrum from the major city mm. to the smaller city. But I think that would require it to be aspirational, it would require it to be affordable, and it needs to be available for folks to actually move. And that's the only sustainable way uh, for this re reverse trend of urbanization to smaller urban towns. And I think that's where I think music, architecture, and I think in India, people love to watch movies. So it's, a, it's actually Friday evening is where most of the movie halls are completely full. So having enough capacity in those malls, in those movie halls, is extremely important for people to congregate to your, exp your, to your point. So I feel that's where we need to think creatively on both sides of the equation. You know, you can't move, every, everything will not move to the satellite cities, some of them will stay how you actually walk the talk is actually very important. Okay, with that, uh, do we have a time to pick up the question? No, okay, sorry. So then uh, <laughs> <laughs> we talk too much. <laughs> but I need a final comment from minister because we have ministers. Do you really think that we can really design the future of the city? Yes. You want a longer answer? I don't know if I have time, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say that one of the things that I'm proudest of uh, in, in Singapore is the, the fact that what we celebrate today, uh, the outcomes from decisions that were made 30 or 40 years ago, and what the, 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 the people who began designing our city, our economy, our, our structures, our, 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 our companies did is design our city of today. So the most important lesson that I have to learn as a Singaporean of today is I need to think of what they did and how they did it and why they did it to design the Singapore of tomorrow. So it has been done before. I'm the beneficiary. My generation is the beneficiary of one example. And we are not the only example. And what you've cited in Ho Chi Minh, uh, for example, that was an intentional approach to designing a city in our modern era. And there are lessons to be learned, but if we learn those lessons well, 
we get to design better cities for tomorrow? So my short answer is yes. That is an encouraging comment. Thank you very much for everybody. Put the big hands with all the panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>